had just gotten to my feet when I heard an explosion. The shock threw me another 20-30 feet in the air, I thought. I tried to get up again while wiping my face so I could see where I was in relation to the car and the flames. No matter how hard or fast I wiped, I couldn't get what I now knew was blood off my eyes. Angelic voices are calling my name from a long way away, and they seem to be getting louder and louder. Cal. Cal baby, come over here, and come to us. I thought, no thanks, I've been through enough tonight, and I don't need any more surprises. I felt hands reaching out and pulling me. I realized that the people who were pulling me were actually holding me up, and that they were five girls from the party I was going to. When they saw that I hadn't arrived yet, they came to the base to hurry me up so I wouldn't miss the going away party. I saw their headlights coming toward me just before the crash, and they were laughing hysterically as they saw the car flip over and careen down the road while catching on fire right in front of them. But when they found out it was my car, that was the worst part. I only remember them saying, you better not die on us. So I gave them a thumbs up sign to let them know I wouldn't. That was about all I could do at that point. They were trying to rush me back to the base hospital in the back seat, so I could keep my promise. Three of the girls sat in the back seat, and the other two put me on their laps. Then the two jumped into the front seat and drove that Ford as fast as they dared, which was a lot, believe me. One of them said through tears as I lay on their laps, Look, Cal saved Tiger. When she reached for the stuffed animal, she was horrified to see that my head was bleeding again. She quickly took Tigger's place in saving my life. Another one saw that my hand was bleeding from all the glass and tore up her skirt to make a bandage. I thought it was great that these girls didn't care that I was making a mess on them in their car. I suddenly found myself sort of sitting up straight and looking out the back window of the fast-moving car. I was amazed to see the burning and smoking blob that used to be my stang fade away. I looked down and saw three girls crying and yelling at the driver to hurry up. Then it hit me. Wow, that's me on their laps and nobody's home. I'm looking out the window at what was left of my poor, wrecked Mustang. The other me is just chilling out and not doing anything. I tried to tell the girls that I was fine and that they could stop crying and calm down a bit. I tried to get the driver's attention by touching her, and she turned her head a little toward me. She seemed to be talking to the girl who was holding my other head and not to me. She said she was going as fast as this eight-cylinder car could go. I didn't feel any pain or fear, even though I was speeding down the highway with five girls. What a start to the night. When we got to the hospital, the two girls in the front ran out like it was a relay race and ran through the doors. When they came back with two corpsmen and a gurney, I was about to leave and head for the swinging doors. I moved out of the way so I could watch them put the other me on it. And as they took him away, I watched the other three girls get themselves together. They all went to the emergency room. I decided to follow them because no one seemed to notice me, and I was curious about what was going on. There were nurses, corpsmen, and a doctor all rushing around, and some of the girls were at the front desk telling the desk clerk about me, while the others pressed their noses against the windows of the operating room. I walked down the hallway and looked at the people sitting on the benches and chairs. They seemed to be waiting to be helped, but there was another me at the front of the line, so I excused myself and went to join her. I walked right in and went around the nurses who were ripping my clothes off and wiping me down. The doctor saw the big hole on the side of my head and was cleaning it up when the corpsman who was standing next to me asked if he could stitch up the cut on my hand. The doctor said it was fine because he didn't think I would live anyway. He said something about having to put a plate in my head, but I had lost so much blood that he didn't know if I would live much longer. The nurse asked if she should have the base chaplain ready, so the doctor took off my dog tags. When he saw Agnostic and Oneg, he said, This kid probably doesn't care, but you can call him if you want. I thought that was rude, and I didn't like it when a corpsman practiced on my hand. I thought, I should complain, but as soon as the thought passed through my mind, I started to float up toward the ceiling. I finally realized that I could see myself on the table being desperately worked on, and that I could also see a mostly transparent version of myself floating above it all. As I floated higher and higher, I looked around and saw dust and dirt on the fluorescent lights in the operating room. I thought, someone is also going to hear about this. I heard the doctor say, Tag him. That plate nurse won't be needed. Corman, do you have that hand finished? Yes, sir, was his answer. The doctor said, Fine, just put a sheet over him for now, son. 
I knew what was going on right then, but I wasn't ready for what was about to happen to the me I was now. I was about to try to get to the girls, who were now crying and hugging each other, but I was being pulled backward and up instead of forward. I had no feeling of fear or loss. All I could feel was wonder, curiosity, and eagerness for what was to come. I went into what I thought was the Holland Tunnel, but there were no cars or people there, and I could see what looked like a light at the end. It wasn't black, but it was dark. I thought the light was coming from the other end of the path, where the sun was shining. As I was being pulled toward the light at the end of the tunnel, I carefully looked around, even squinting to see into the darker spots. I saw what I thought were very religious men doing what they would do when praying to their gods. They all wore their best clothes, like robes, togas, headdresses, loincloths, and other similar things. Most of them were on the sides of the tunnel, but one of them was sitting in the middle of the tunnel, with his hands in his lap and his feet crossed. He looked Asian and had a long grayish hair. I thought that since I had just finished two tours in the country, he must represent the last religion I wanted to adopt as my own. I was raised Catholic, but I left that religion when I was young and looked into many others, such as the Mayan, Quran, Hopi, and all North and South American native religions. It looked like each one of them was here. When I floated past the monk just below me, it looked like he could see me because he started to smile. All of the other religious men were making mumbling sounds like prayers and moving their arms around as if to bless themselves. I didn't know if they were praying for me or for the tunnel. I saw that none of them were sitting or standing in the tunnel. Instead, they seemed to be floating. I wanted to stop and talk to some of them, maybe ask them who they were and how long they had been there, but I was being pulled toward the light. I saw wisps of smoke that I thought were fire. It came from the whole big tunnel, from one end to the other. I could see and smell, but I hadn't felt anything yet, because my feet never touched the floor of the tunnel. As I moved toward the end, I felt like I was going straight down the middle. As I got closer to the end of the tunnel, things got brighter. As I got close to the end, it was like coming face to face with a huge canvas that had just been painted the brightest white there is. I had a blank canvas that was ready to be painted on, and I was waiting for that painting. Then, in an instant, my whole life, from the time I was born until now, flashed before my eyes like a strobe light that was only going half as fast. Frame after frame, with some parts frozen, even if just for a second, before moving on to the next. I felt like I was being put through a test to see if I was the right me to be here. Then it was over as quickly as it had started. The last scene was of a rolling mass of metal finally catching fire, and I looked back at the canvas. As I stared into the vast whiteness, I looked down at my body to use it as a guide. But when I looked down, the outline of my body that had been there before was gone. I thought, this can't be. Am I now a part of this blank white canvas? If I am, where do these questions come from if I am a part of it? I saw right away that a bright, glowing ball of gold was coming toward me. It got bigger as it got closer, and when it was about the size of a beach ball and right above and in front of me, it shone brightly and changed into an indescribable being of pure light that floated right in front of me. It was taller than the tallest person I had ever seen, and wider than two of me, but its size and shape were so well balanced that it was of magnificent stature. It looked like the lines around its features were made with a fine ink quill. Everything about her, including her hair, face, and robe, was golden and flowing, like an electric charge, or even a nuclear charge. This was the essence of energy. As its shape became more solid, so did everything behind it. It felt like the whole white canvas I had found at the end of the tunnel was now alive, and I was a part of it. Other figures appeared in front of and behind the being in me. Some had wings, but most didn't. Some were fully formed, while others weren't. Still others looked like glowing orbs of light and color that bounced like bubbles in a glass of carbonated water. I couldn't take it anymore. Every feeling I'd ever felt was coming up ten times stronger. I was about to talk or ask a question when the being spoke to me. Its voice was like a chorus of voices, neither male nor female, loud nor quiet, shallow nor deep, but perfect and all-encompassing. As I looked at the two beautiful beings with bright capes standing next to it, it said, those are Michael and Gabriel. 
Michael has chosen you as his own, and Gabriel will show you the way. I looked past them and saw another large being. It was beautiful, but darker, like the robe it wore. The light being said, That is the one who has been kicked out. Those of you to whom I've given a choice, you can choose any of these. I figured that since I had a choice and Michael had already picked me, I would pick him. He looked strong and powerful, like the others, but his eyes seemed to have a fire that drew me in and held me. Gabriel's eyes were softer and more understanding, and I thought to myself, oh, how beautiful these beings are. Then I looked at the being in front of me, and I saw that its eyes were full of love and warmth, authority, and power. He seemed to like my choice, and then he told me, you will be my soldier, and for a while you will go with Michael. Gabriel will sometimes come to you. I will send others to you, and when the gathering comes, your fruit won't fall far from the tree. Right at that moment, I saw five balls of light. They looked like they were having fun, swirling around the being and me. They came from the countryside, and I saw that they were all the same size and shape, but their colors were as subtle as the colors of rose petals, except for one, which was blue. Before I could ask, it spoke and said, they, like all of you here, are of me, but these will come to you, and you will care for them more. I thought the being was telling me that these were my children, but I was only twenty-one, and had never been married, and had no plans to. I didn't know what all of this had to do with me or him, until a beautiful crystal platter with the colors of many rainbows shone in front of me. In an instant, it broke into a million pieces, each of which was beautiful on its own. Slowly, the pieces started coming back together to make the original serving platter again, and I finally understood what this being of light was trying to show me. We are the platter. I was just one of those millions of pieces, just like everyone I saw here and back in the world. At this point, my thoughts were still trying to figure out the gathering. As I tried to figure out what this could mean, the being told me, here you will see the signs that bring about the gathering. At that moment, I saw frames pop up like TV screens. When I looked at the screens, the images would come together, form a picture, and pop into my mind. I felt like I was getting pushed back by the force of it. They were just glimpses, but they were so real that I felt like they were happening right in front of me. I couldn't look away, and it felt like I was becoming a part of each vision. There were scenes of uniformed men killing other uniformed men. I recognized some of the insignias, and some of them were from the United States. There were also thousands of them who weren't in uniform, and killed even more thousands of people who also weren't in uniform. It was like watching toy figures move on their own and run over other figures. Different countries, different nations, different religions, different weapons, and different decades. But the result was always hundreds of thousands dead and dying. I wanted to leave, because I could feel how much pain these people were in. I asked the being why this was happening, and how long it would last. The being told me, Man will eat man, until man prays for man. The next vision was of floods. Many of them were happening at different times of year on different continents, and I was walking through them again, feeling their power and smelling death. Hundreds of people died, and acres and acres of crops and livestock and wild animals floated away into the abyss. Then I was watching volcanoes erupt all over the world, one after the other. The molten lava is burying whole towns and villages, along with the people and animals who live there. I looked around the ruins and saw that not much of what used to be there was still there. The last thing I saw on the screen was parts of almost every continent being destroyed by earthquakes. One was a huge one in the United States. Most of the others were in Asia and Europe. Again, thousands of people are killed, buildings are destroyed, and the land is flattened. I turned back to the being, and he said, Not only will you see more of what you have already seen, but there will come a time when it will all happen at the same time and in the same way. I didn't have time to ask because he said, They will turn away from me and call themselves gods. With that, Michael called me to go with him, and I became a part of the universe. I looked at novas, suns, and planets from Earth not too long ago. Or was it? We went toward the center of the universe which is where everything started. There were kazillions of planets around kazillions of suns, and the more we got close to the center, the more galaxies we saw. Everything in the universe is like the plate you saw. When it broke, 
the biggest piece ended up in the middle, and the pieces that broke first ended up farthest from the center. Everything is just a circle inside a circle inside a circle. Each level or dimension is just another layer of the original, which goes on forever. I watched as millions of orbs went into the planets in a planned way. They looked like bees buzzing from flower to flower to pollinate each one. Michael brought me closer, and I could now see that many of these planets had life on them, and that the orbs were joining with the creatures on these planets. Not every living thing on every planet was the same, but they all had a head, a body, and limbs, and the light beings would give them life for a while. Now that we were leaving the center, Michael told me that Gabriel would have more to tell me, and that he, Michael, wanted me to know that he was happy with how often he had asked me to do his will, and how well I did it. You will never be made to forget again, were his last words. I was on my way back to where I knew Earth was, and I watched as comets and asteroids went by me, or I went by them. The gaseous cloud formations stood out because of their bright colors. I started looking at these young galaxies like clouds on Earth and imagining what shapes they were taking. This one was a boat, this one was a bird with wings, and this one was a scarf blowing in the wind. I kept doing this until I saw what was the constellation Orion and knew I was getting close to my destination. I saw two fiery celestial bodies moving parallel to its center. They looked like twin arrows coming out of an archer's bow, and they were headed straight for the blue marble of home. Right away, I could see millions of people crying because parts of New York City had been destroyed. I had a strange feeling that I hadn't felt before, and I thought it might be because I had grown up in this city. I saw an 8.6 magnitude earthquake in a place called Eureka. A ham operator or radio announcer told thousands of people who were leaving areas where disasters happened often where they could go to be safe. Because of an explosion inside, it looked like a space station was falling from the sky. Several countries were all firing missiles into space at the same time. I thought the light being had shown me everything, but these were different, stronger, and there was no pre-screening like before. Gabriel showed up next to me. I thought it was because I was feeling shaky, but he was there to explain the galactic view of my galaxy, which was getting bigger and bigger. The sun was getting bigger and sending out huge balls of ectoplasm, which it had never done before, and in the same direction that the planets would move. I couldn't take my eyes off the Earth as I watched what these eruptions would do to it. A big mass went by me. It was bigger than any planet I knew, and as it went by, I saw the Earth wobbling like a top nearing the end of its spin. The spinning stopped, and then slowly started up again. But now it was tilted, and I felt like a lens zooming in on me. The ash clouds that had covered the Earth started to thin out and fall apart, like a piece of metal that had been welded together with tacks. I could see that the oceans were starting to rise, starting with the Pacific along the Ring of Fire, and then synchronistically moving to the other oceans. As the water moved around the land masses, the land masses started to sink under the water, putting pressure on them. When the pressures evened out with the change in the axis's spin, the Earth didn't look the same as it did before. It was newer, cleaner, and prettier, with greens that were darker and blues that were lighter. Some of the new land masses looked like some of the places I had seen with Michael on other planets. People lived on this planet and seemed happier and more content even though they seemed to be living the same way as the native peoples of the past. People who had made it to this new world were now living in the ancient one's cities that were buried under the water. I saw tribes join together and small countries form, but what I didn't see broke my heart. No more wars happened. People finally found real peace and happiness. Gabriel now tells me that this is the message I need to bring back from him, to tell people that they have little to worry about because the earth will last forever just like all the other planets I've been to. I'm supposed to tell everyone to look up, and then they'll know when the new world will come. I asked, what about the other people on Earth at the time of the change? Gabriel told me that everything will end. Some will be lifted higher than others, and no longer enjoy the physical plane, while others will be left on Earth to replenish and rebuild the physical. They will also be on a higher level than the people who live there now. I was back in front of the light being of gold, Five balls were still moving around. I wanted to stay with the other light beings and explore this realm, but I was told I couldn't. I was brought here to tell the people who would come after me that their creator is eagerly waiting for them 
if they spread the love they brought with them to the physical world. The being told me that if I ever had questions about my heart or mind, he would answer them if I looked inside myself, because that's where he would live. From now on, all I have to do is think it's true, and it will be true. I will always know the truth. I was told that there was still a lot of work to do, and that God had put rocks in the way to block my way. Many people will be put in front of me so I can help them. I won't do more, but I can't let that go wrong, because I don't want a soul to be lost in my heart. I asked how I would know, but before I got an answer, I was being sucked through that dark tunnel like a dust bunny in a vacuum, with about as much control as a runaway train. When I woke up, a nurse was scrubbing blood off the right side of my head. My body hurt like crazy. I yelled at the nurse for what I thought was her lack of caring, and she looked surprised. Oh my God, sailor, welcome home. We were sure you were dead. I asked her where I was and how long I had been there, and she told me, you've been in a coma for seven days now. They thought you had died on the operating table and were about to take you to the morgue when the corpsman helping with the surgery saw you moving under the sheet and rushed you back to the operating room. The doctor checked you out and was surprised to see that your vital signs were getting back to normal. But what really shocked him was that the hard crust that had formed over the hole in your head seemed to have stopped most of the damage. He decided he didn't even have to put a steel plate in your head anymore because it had healed enough on its own while you were gone. I said, you mean the practicing corpsmen who were sewing my hand in the operating room saved my life? Yes, she said, but how did you know he was sewing your hand? You were asleep the whole time you were in the operating room and only just now woke up. If she had known everything I knew about that time, she would have been shocked, I said. I took the brush and towel from her hands and told her I would finish the job for her. She thanked me and said she would tell the doctors that I was alive and alert. When I looked across the dorm, I saw a Marine, a few sailors, and their beds. The Marine was closest to me and looked like he knew me. He smiled and said, Hey, Mr. Chuck, a name I picked up overseas. You missed a great party last week. I said, So I hear, but you should have been at the one I went to. He told me that the local papers had written about me and that a picture of what was left of my car was on the second page of the news. Then he said, I bet you're glad they're going to sign your discharge papers and not your death certificate, like they almost did. I laughed and said, Yeah, you know those Navy doctors, in and out, they'd sign anything to get their liberty passes. The doctor finally came and started to check me out. He seemed genuinely interested and surprised by how quickly I was getting better. First, he touched the side of my head, then he touched my arms and legs. After doing the follow my fingers and count how many there are doctor thing, he asked me if I could stand. He was shocked when I jumped out of bed. He asked me if I could raise my arms over my head, thinking I couldn't. When I did, he asked if I could slowly reach my toes, which I could. Then he sat me down on the bed and started talking to me. He told me that I was a miracle in medicine. Not only was I not supposed to still be alive after losing so much blood, but my head injury was also supposed to make me a vegetable at the very least. He also said that the injuries to my legs and arms should have kept me in the hospital for another two to three weeks. But there I was, with no black and blue marks to show what my body had been through and everything working fine. He said he had to admit it was a miracle, and when I asked if I could go back to active duty, he said he didn't see why not. He signed my papers to get me out of the hospital, and the next day I went back to my squad. It was nice to be alive again but I knew that the place I had been was much, much better than any place on earth could ever be. I remembered everything that happened to me in that other place, but I never told anyone about it. Just mentioning that I had been dead made people twitch their fingers near their brains when they thought I wasn't looking, and sometimes I wasn't looking, but I knew.